This meeting is now being recorded. Good afternoon, Derby agents and friends. This is Kevin Shady calling you live from Louisville, Kentucky, where we're getting ready for football season. It's going to be a great year for the Cards, the Cats, and of course for my Hoosiers as they make it to Pasadena for the Rose Bowl. And yes, they will upset the Ohio State Buckeyes now that they don't have a quarterback. But I digress. We're not here to talk about the Hoosiers or college football. We're here to talk today about HarborLink Networks, and we've got uh, Travis Tangeman with us who's going to explain their Wi-Fi hotspot uh, uh, management solution and how that can be a great tool for you to sell to your existing clients as well as drive new business for you and your agency. So with that, Travis, take it away. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Um, Kevin, you almost just lost your speaker with that whole thing about Ohio State. We'll talk about that offline. Uh, but I <laughs> uh, want to appreciate everybody coming out and uh, getting a chance to update everybody about HarborLink. Uh, so let's kind of jump in, and I'd like it if anybody has questions or comments, just go ahead and interrupt me, um, and let's just make this thing kind of a more of a free-flowing conversation as we go. Um, basically, the Wi-Fi world, and we all know this, is that customers now expect seamless connectivity no matter where they are, and it's always got to be on their own device. And I don't think this is news to anybody, uh, but it's becoming more and more important that you have to have an infrastructure that can handle uh, all the myriad of devices that people uh, are bringing into the restaurants, the bars, the retail outlets, you name it, uh, because everywhere people go, they expect to have free Wi-Fi. And uh, it's been amazing to see the difference uh, over the years. I mean, we've HarborLink's been in the Wi-Fi industry now for 16 years, and uh, you look at the impact that mobile devices have had on an industry, and it's just absolutely amazing. So with that said, what we've done is we have come up with a solution that maintains affordability but also has the reliability and the robustness to handle uh, the myriad of devices that are out there and are trying to connect at all times. Um, this is one of our cheesier song, uh, slides that we'll ever throw you, but we are true believers in this and that there is three things that are very important to making public Wi-Fi work. And that is it has to be a solid venue, um, we have to have good partners, and we have to have, obviously, the people in the end users who are going to use it. Um, why that's important is the relationship, honestly, between HarborLink, the venues, and partners like yourselves who are all working together to bring the best solution possible to those end users that are using the service. Uh, I don't want to go too far into that. It obviously makes sense. Um, but what we like... Um, is relationship selling. Um, we like to have relationships with our venues and with our partners. Um, and I think uh, Kent McMillian can speak to this here in a few slides uh, about how important it is to work directly with customers uh, so that they can get what they're looking for. And it's not just some solution that seems canned or being forced down their throat. It's something they can truly back and get excited about. Yep. And if I can learn around that. There we go. Hey, Travis, so, just for – yeah. Travis, don't mind, could you go back one that, – that, that slide? Sure. And, and can you touch a little bit more on, say, the advertising and media sponsorship potential uh, of the solution? Sure. Um, we, I've got a slide on that a little later on. But um, basically, with our platform that we have created and that we take care of, is the opportunity to have advertising displayed during the Wi-Fi session. So when a, net, a user comes into the network, they are presented with a sign-in page that is branded for the venue. We can then insert advertising either on that same page. It can be inserted as a interstitial video prior to exceeding uh, access to the network or it can be part of a landing page as well. So there's two pages that are always seen during a Wi-Fi visit. Uh, the first one that says click here to accept. The second one is what we call a landing page or a welcome page, which is you're successfully on the Internet, go about your business, but one more touch point for the venue. Any one of those spots can carry advertising, and that advertising can be a national campaign that goes to various sites, 
down to hyper location sensitive advertising where it could be the flower shop next door to where we're talking. So it's very, very robust. It's very easy. Um, and it really is. It's a, as Kevin said, it's a great way to make additional dollars and a way for venues to offset uh, the costs involved of providing Wi-Fi to their customers. Right, and that's kind of where I was wanting to make sure we got to it is, guys, we'll make money off of the advertising revenues, and the client can also – uh, the client also gets a piece of that advertising revenue to where it could just offset the entire cost uh, of their Wi-Fi service. So, all right. For that note, so here's a quick look at some of our current customers. Um, basically, we do everything from small mom-and-pop shops to national restaurant chains to cities. Uh, so the city of Bellevue, Washington, we actually do almost two square miles of their downtown. Uh, we also do uh, parts of the uh, surrounding areas of Dayton, Ohio, up in Columbus. Uh, we do uh, library systems. Uh, so, And a lot of college campuses actually is another one of our areas. So there really is no market that doesn't have Wi-Fi of some sort. Um, it, the biggest thing is starting to get people to understand that, all, you know, if they have a public aspect to their company, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a, a mattress warehouse, you know, whatever it might be, if it has a public aspect of it, there will be an expectation of some sort of connectivity. And we can provide that and give it a face and a label. So, So not all Wi-Fi service providers are equal. Your customers are those best, and that's us. I'm very confident in that. Um, but what we aren't, and this is um, this seems like a silly slide, but let me just do a quick why this is in here. What we aren't is that we are not some basic little Wi-Fi access that all it does is sit there, broadcast a beacon, and let people on the internet. Anybody can do that. You can go down to Best Buy, buy a Linksys. Throw it in there, and for 75 bucks, you're done. That does not do you any good as a, as a retail establishment uh, from getting your branding out. It doesn't have robustness, um, so that is not what we are. We are not some little Verizon box that only four people can use at a time and cost a bunch of money on bandwidth. And we are definitely not some behemoth like an AT&T who is very slow to things, who is expensive, who is difficult to work with. We are a small company. We are nimble. We're fast. And we are very customer-centric. So we are all about providing the service that the customer is looking for, and we are very creative when it comes to it. So we love hearing our customers come to us and tell us what they want. We don't really ever go out with a pitch. We don't really go out with a, this is what you should do. We generally start almost all of our conversations with, what do you want? And we, based on that, we'll come up with a solution for you that will knock your socks off. So that's just a little bit of a differential for you. So here's where we are. Uh, and like I said, I'm not going to read the slide to you, but we are robust. We are flexible, nimble, affordable, all those things I was just talking about. All comes down to what we provide out of our devices and out of our network. So, with um, you know, when I mentioned in that last slide about that little Linksys, if you look at the box that's pictured on this one, this is one of the radios that we use. We can actually develop very sophisticated networking that is PCI compliant, which is very huge with anybody involving credit cards. Where if you see those ports on the front of that box right there, we can segregate networks throughout that box, even port-based. So we could say, break those ports into two, you know, two ports each into different networks and actually drive Wi-Fi traffic directly out certain ports to be delivered for certain services. So we can separate logically as well as virtually all the networking on that box and through a, and through a facility. Um, so it's a very large differential for us in this network. Uh, and against a lot of our competition. A lot of our competition are all about just putting a radio out, and they say, here's your two options, your three options. We have an infinite number of options all within the same box.
the Carbonlink's management platform. So what do we do? Basically, management and monitoring. This is the basic nuts and bolts of Wi-Fi operation. So you're doing things like user authentication and accounting, um, making sure the thing works. Obviously, we do it. Um, we do uh, worry about safety and security. Uh, we are compliant with CALEA and SAFE Act. Uh, we can respond to law enforcement uh, and RIA complaints. Um, so we already do it. This is the really, like I said, this is the nuts and bolts. Support, obviously we have it. Uh, landing pages. This is the part where it gets interesting and can have a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm going to skip ahead here in a bit because this is where Kent and I can talk a little bit about how you customize. But we do all the creation of landing pages for our customers. So we work with their marketing departments to get all the right creative, to get a look and feel, to get a user experience that matches as best as they want their normal marketing message. So we can actually become a strong marketing tool not just some other services out there that gets completely ignored. So it's a really, you know, if you ever go to a lot of places for using Wi-Fi, it, it almost seems a lot of cookie cutter when you're out there. It's got a start button, and that's it. You know, it's maybe got a logo. We can do so much more down to actually targeting individuals, targeting the location. That you can bring in special content just to each page, um, that that's where marketing departments can get really excited and we can have a lot of fun with this. So I'm going to give that one a sec for you guys to take a look. But we, what we call our application is called OnSite. And uh, basically OnSite was created out of the concept of what do you want people to see? What do you want people to interact with when they are on site, on-premise of your location. So, again, you go to a lot of national chains and you go to their Wi-Fi, the same look and feel applies to Dayton, Ohio, as it does to Louisville, Kentucky, as it does to Pasadena, California. What on-site is all about is how do we take the information, knowing exactly where that person is standing, we can actually tell you how many times that person has been there, we can tell you all kinds of fun information so that we can actually drive special content to a page based all around what we know. So, it's again, it's how do you get people excited? How do you greet somebody? So, in a sense, if we have the opportunity to gain either a person's name or even if we don't know their name, but we recognize their device, we can welcome them differently than if we know somebody has never been there ever before. So if we can say, hey, this one device has been in the network six times in a week, you know it's obviously a regular customer. You can greet them with their own special. You could give them their own coupon versus just saying, hey, welcome, click here to go. So, just again, it's all about creativity and flexibility. Are you capturing their MAC address from their phone or are you doing it from some other, other uh, information? All, all of the above. So, again, it, this is where you're going to hear us always say it depends. And that sounds like a cop-out, but it's not. It depends on what the customer wants us to do. Because what we can do is grab the MAC address. Or we can have forms built that say, hey, sign up today, give us your username. Or not your, but your, your name or, you know, some other piece of information so that we can track that person. So we've become a de facto uh, customer management solution as well for the venues. So, again, in the restaurant industry especially, a lot of them are very early on in trying to build their VIP clubs and things like that. If anything, they've done the business card drop, you know, kind of idea of the old fishbowl. Um, what we have the opportunity to do is actually build that on the fly very inexpensively for them where they can then go right back and keep touching that person every time they come into the store. So you could you could essentially be their rewards program for them, right? Absolutely, absolutely. The so target markets. The target markets are things everything you pretty much imagine, but the most important one is the one at the bottom. Use your imagination. I love when people come to us with one I would never have imagined, and Kent is going to bring the one up 
where he brought us a, a retailer of mattresses. Never in a million years would I ever have thought, hey, you know what, we, go, we should go out to the mattress market. But you know what? They had a need. It was a neat project. It, you know, everything about it is something I wouldn't have thought of. So, again, I go back to just because it's not a restaurant, just because it's not the obvious, doesn't mean they may not have a need or desire for what we're talking about. Okay, Kevin, here's your advertising slide. <laughs> so, advertising. Um, the advertising is absolute must-see. You cannot get on our network without seeing it if it's implemented. And I, let me make sure that I stress that. Some retailers absolutely will not let you put advertising on their network. Others will. So it's going to come down to each individual account. But the ones who do, they absolutely have to see at least two pages, uh, which means we have two impressions, if not a third, if we do an interstitial. And that advertising revenue, based on how we've worked with, a, with Derby, a piece of that advertising revenue does come back to both you and Derby. So there is a percentage in there for you guys if you, if you bring us sites, but also if you bring us advertisers to go on the sites, you get an even larger percentage. Am I correct in saying that, Kevin? Correct. Okay. So um, in the case on here, there's a standard, you know, Amazon ad. Um, we, we use uh, some national uh, suppliers to kind of fill in the fluff, if you will, with basic ads. But we also um, just had a really neat campaign that went through our Buffalo Wild Wings um, locations where when you went in and you clicked the start button, you got shown a seven to eight second long video before you could skip. It was from Dr. Scholes. Would never have imagined it, but Dr. Scholes came to us. And they ended up paying in the neighborhood of about 37 cents per impression to have that ability. So if you imagine how many impressions we're able to drive through a restaurant chain, it revs up really quickly, and it's a nice piece of change. And let me so, give you an uh, idea, guys, um, and, and Mike knows this, uh, a chain like Texas Roadhouse, where they've got about 400 to, to 450 locations, they do 9 million impressions uh, a month. Now, let me ask you this, Travis. We've seen advertising and Wi-Fi and connecting uh, the dots there with uh, uh, some other partners that we've had, and you know which one I'm referring sure. to. And, and yeah. they went so far as to do what was what, what I think was, it's called a captive portal, where uh, you can actually change the ads, say, from the ESPN uh, or Google search that comes through. Do you guys do that type of activity? Uh, we do not. Um, that's a that's a little borderline. Um, uh, uh, that's close to illegal. If it flat out isn't, I'd have to actually look into that. But no, we've had the technology. People have presented it to us. Uh, no, we've avoided it. Uh, it just seemed a little slimy. No, it's a little too it. risky. Yeah, I just I I don't touch uh, other people's content. Uh, the closest thing we've ever done to something like that is skinning things where we would actually, we've had one where we broadcast live streams that have, so it would like be a sporting event or what have you, and it would live stream through our page, but we would actually, um, we would actually border the entire page with our own ad, but allow the other content to run freely through the center. Right. So it's, yeah, I, I don't, I don't get into the game of messing with other people's content. That's just a good way to get in trouble. Okay, so this is a Derby agency example, and this is the one we I just referred to earlier that I worked on with Ken, and uh, it's a place called Innovative uh, Mattress Solutions, and I just completely slurred that, but sorry. Anyway, um, and what these are, what you're looking at is during our negotiations and conversations early on, they came to us and said, we don't want just a straightforward start button. We want to learn something about our customers. So what we did is actually built for them custom pages that were both mobile and desktop ready, and that's what you're looking at. And in those pages, what they wanted, they wanted to learn something about their customer. 
Because what they were saying is they have maybe three to four people come into each store per day. So they had to make the most of people who were using things and they wanted to learn about them. So what we did is we built a portal that had Facebook capabilities to it as the login me uh, mechanism, or they could fill out a form. Uh, I don't recommend forms typically uh, for other types of uh, environments, restaurants or what have you, but in this instance it actually made sense. And so what we did is we built this up. You could use Facebook or the form, as you can see. And what they wanted to do is after you did that, they wanted to have a coupon delivered. So as you can see, as people came through, as soon as they signed up, they got a thank you message. Here's your 50 bucks off your next mattress purchase. Good for whatever. That's what we've done for this uh, customer. They love the solution. Um, but if I can be so bold, I th you know, they, when we talked to them the other day, they like just working with us. I think it was a responsiveness. It was our ability to be creative with them, to work with them, to match what they're asking for. And, again, it goes back to a good relationship rather than just here's a product. And I'm going to let Kent talk for a couple seconds if you'd like and you know, make sure I'm not completely out of it. Well, you're not out of it, Travis. I mean, actually, this was – one of the easier sales, uh, and then it's coming, I think, we're, what are we doing in October, the deployment, late October? Mm -hmm. for, yeah, and um, essentially, this customer had two needs. I'm going to bring up the other one. They don't have much traffic, but the people they do get is high volume for their company. Uh, they also had another need, which is something that Harbor Lake could do, is their store associates, the people that work there, are moving to a tablet-based point of sale system um, and Travis was able to do two things he's able to give a private Wi-Fi connection which will allow them to go over their MPLS network nobody else can touch so they can place orders point of sale check inventory and then a public one for the people that are coming in so there was actually two needs for this customer if you remember Travis they wanted yeah, to be able to appreciate you running that. yeah uh, so at the time they were they were stuck with the PC on their counter. Now they could walk around the store, show a mattress, do financing options, things like that on a on a uh, iPad, and nobody from the outside world can see that. It, it, it's private connection, VPN back to an MPLS cloud, and then he segregated that through their box for the public Wi-Fi. And this customer really just wanted customer information. So they believe if somebody comes in there and they walk out, they lose them. They'll go somewhere else and buy a mattress. Everybody sells mattresses. So uh, they were wanting to capture information, get them on mailing lists. Another third thing, Travis, uh, I think Harbor Lake did great is this customer is geographically sporadic with different brand names, different regions, different markets have different promotions, and he's able to uh, – customize that per market, per advertising campaign. So this has Sleep Outfitters, but they also have one called Mattress King in Alabama. They have mattress warehouses throughout uh, Ohio and West Virginia, so they have different brands as well. Um, so he's able to brand differentiate and run the promos per store, per geographic location. And I think, like you said, Travis, the thing they like the best is we drove out there to see you. He said that they were, this was highly competitive. The Cisco was in there, Dell was in there, some other people pitching this. Travis said, hey, i got a unit sitting on my desk. Let's go to the closest store. We go 15 minutes, plugged it in, it worked immediately. Um, yeah, that was, actually, that was a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I've never seen anybody do that. The other guys hadn't even given them a quote yet or even a demo unit and said, uh, we already had the quote. We had the quote in 48 hours, and he knew we were coming. So he made a dummy splash page. He went over to the store, plugged it in. Boom. It's working. Yep. And then they said, well, we want to take one back to corporate. Travis said, all right, I'll have you one there tomorrow. He said, extra one, did some more customization. The other guys took him a month to get into quote. Travis almost said I had the work done within a week. So that was very impressive. Cool. Well, thanks, Ken. I appreciate that. Yeah, and then also, there's other things they want. The analyticals, you went through all that with them. They wanted to capture information, demographics, things of that, and they were impressed by that. Yep. 
And Kent, how much did you have to do with this? I had to I had to drive one day. Uh, um, sit in a few meetings, do about two conference calls. You're going to end up with um, you know well under five figures on this, and this is an account that'll continue to grow, uh, as we're told that. Um, uh, Innovative Mattress Solutions is in an acquisition mode, and they're out there uh, acquiring more uh, mattress stores in the southeast uh, and probably branching out to other areas, too. Great opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity, Kent. No yeah, problem. thank you, Kent. All right. So this one I always do for the folks who have not met with us before, and it's it makes sense when you hear what I'm about to say is, our company is actually an offshoot of a company my father started in 1969. And that company was a manufacturer's rep firm for engineered metal products. And the reason I'm telling you all that is that we come from a sales background. My brother and I who run Harborlink, we are salesmen first. And that is we understand what sales are. But more important is we understand the value of reps. Uh, we have maintained a small number count in our office because we work well with third party. We work well with agents. And we want you guys to be successful. We want you guys out there wanting to pimp our products for us. Pardon the expression. But the biggest thing is every rep in the world knows that it's only as good as the relationship you have with the company that you're repping for. And I can tell you from experience, I've seen a lot of companies say, hey, you're doing great. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Go away. And that will not happen with us. Uh, we've been in this industry a long time, and uh, we are the good old-fashioned Midwest boys. Everything's in a handshake. Um, you can give me all the pieces of paper you want, but if we shake hands and look each other in the eyes, I won't screw you, don't screw me kind of attitude. So that's how we work with folks. Um, it works well, and uh, that's just one of those things. So kind of how you can expect to work with us. And there's... Some quick facts about HarborLink. Like I said, we uh, found it in 99, actually split it off from our parent company in 2005. Uh, then uh, there's my uh, my ugly mug along with Rick, our CEO. And then if you ever call our office, you can always talk to Rhonda, who will basically, she's the hardest working person in the whole place. So uh, that's, that's HarborLink, and that's what I've got. So let's open it up and see if anybody's got questions, concerns, what you got. I stunned him, Kevin. No. Jim <laughs> Henderson here. Tell them how big the market is. Tell them the diversity of the market. I think that's really important. And then tell them about the demand curve that's in place right now. I, I apologize. You broke up a little bit. I, I think I heard you talk about the diversity of the product. Or the well... How many different retail locations, like Kent's got mattresses, restaurants, what are some of the other places, Travis, that you see are opportunities? And okay. then how do you see the market growing in the next five years? So the, let's talk to the diversity part first. The diversity part is, I mean, again, I can go back. I've done... Everything personally from lawyers' offices, coffee shops. I mean, you can think of the restaurant industry alone as the the, the normal. Uh, but lawyers' offices, doctors' offices, anywhere people wait, uh, tire and battery shops. Uh, you know, there's really no off-limit place that I can think of. Um, um, you know, we've gotten into starting doing uh, malls um, or even into, you know, larger box stores. Uh, what's neat about what we provide is that even in a circumstance, I'm, I'm going to throw it out, it's not one of our customers, I'm not claiming it, but in the case of like a Walmart or a Lowe's or something, you know, that, in a large-scale place like that, these places already have Wi-Fi systems. But what we can do is we can back-end any existing wireless network that's already in place and give it the functionality that I just told you about. That is one unique feature of what we do. 
A lot of places says it's, you know, we'll go in and say it's our hardware or nothing. You have to go with us. You have to use this access point. We don't do that. What we can do is tie into any existing infrastructure and give it a face and a brand. So it really does speak to the, if there's Wi-Fi there, it can be made branded and it can be made functional. Um, for the growth side, the growth, I don't have the numbers handy, uh, but the ones I look at coming out of Gardner and looking at some of the other ones I get, the Wi-Fi sales are going through the roof. Okay. Um, it, it is exploding um, across all markets. The only market, if I recall, that was a little flat right now is education is at a slow growth, mainly because they just, a lot of the places upgraded to 802.11n a couple years ago, and they're waiting to see if the next standards are really worth spending money on. But that doesn't really affect necessarily what we're talking about. So in the education market especially, so if you guys all have any leads into colleges, um, you know, universities, or even into the K-12. I'm not big on K-12 as much, uh, just because there's a lot of pieces to go to it, but they all have wireless networks. Not a single one out there is waiting to get one, but we can go in and slide in, and we can have our service up and running across an entire college campus in a matter of about 30 minutes. So it's something to, to think about if you have any of those kind of uh, contacts. We're, um, if I'm hearing you right, we're broadband agnostic, and to a certain degree, we're Wi-Fi equipment agnostic, and a customer can still utilize and brand their uh, Wi-Fi landing page through HarborLinks, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can tell you, we've done, I mean, I've worked with, Every major wireless vendor out there, we've had solutions with them, so um, I'd be hard-pressed to come up with one we've never worked with. Uh, it's just, it is completely agnostic, and we've meant it to be that way. And guys, from a pricing perspective, the uh, the box that Travis showed you there uh, is typically uh, $500 uh, per site. Uh, it is commissionable. Uh, the service is, I, I want to say the service is typically 50 bucks a month. Is that right? Approximately. Yeah, somewhere Just in depending that. On what we're, depends on what we're talking about, yeah. Right. You know, and, and then, you know, the, you know, then on the, on the marketing and, and development side, it just depends, you know, on uh, how involved they want to be. I know in the case of Sleep Outfitters, they're doing a lot of the uh, images and, and, and management and, and control of it. Uh, and, and Travis gives them a lot of reports and statistics and all that kind of stuff, or at least that's what they're looking to do uh, once they uh, deploy it um, uh, here um, in September, October time frame. What about the management reports? You didn't touch on that very much. Oh, um, sorry about that. Uh, we do them. <laughs> now, actually, what we've done, we actually contracted with uh, the University of Dayton Research Institute. They're about a $50 million research institute here in Dayton. Uh, to actually work with us on how to take the amount of data we have, because uh, our logs, we our logs are amazingly large of how much data we track about everything. And what we did is we built a tool. Um, the number one thing we found is everybody always wants to say they want reports, but what we found is nobody ever looks at reports. Um, so we've built I don't know how many iterations of reporting over the year over the years, but out of all of our customers, we only had three or four that ever looked at their reports on any sort of regular basis. So it got us to thinking, and so we actually just finished this thing up about a month or so ago, and what happens now is the whole process is automated. So at the first of the month, a PDF is emailed per site to wherever email address we want. So if it is you know, to the store level or if you want it to a corporate level, we send off a usage report that outlines how many unique users they had, so how many unique devices that came in the network, how many people, how many times people use the network. So versus 20 laptops or whatever it is came into a store last month, 
it's 20 left, but they came in three or four times each. So it's actually 20 unique users with 60 sessions. So we, out, we break both of those out for them. We break out how their bandwidth is being consumed and how much, uh, what the time of day, our, uh, day of the week breakdowns, things like that. Real basic overview of what is going on, and we email that out every month at the start of the month along with any uh, updates or little newsworthy items that go with it. Um, from there, we can get even deeper into the analytics side or however nerdy they want to get, but we find that that covers about 90% of what people are really looking for. Hey, hey guys, Mike Wagner here. I've got a question, and um, uh, maybe you can elaborate. You may have already mentioned it, probably have. But can you touch on um, somebody that goes out and wants to do, uh, they claim they're not interested in the, the landing pages and things of that nature, and they just plug Wi-Fi right into their network. And can you talk about how they might be exposed from a uh, PCI-compliant perspective and, uh, sure. you know, Target, TF Chang's and stuff like that? And are you seeing a lot right. of that? Yeah, well, absolutely, and I actually appreciate you bringing it up because I, did, I didn't touch on that earlier. But, no, you're absolutely correct. Um, so there's a huge, huge issue out in the, uh, out in the field of people um, plugging land, wireless access points in, you know, a link to this, or I mean, it doesn't matter what the model is. But it, a traditional wireless access point has no ability to keep people from traversing over the entire network. So people are going out in restaurants, they're taking a, an access point, plugging it right into the same network that uses their credit card machine, you know, the credit cards are running over, their own personal computers are running over. Um, you know, my wife actually is a prosecutor here in Montgomery County, and uh, she and about 30 other prosecutors went to a restaurant uh, in Dayton that did not use my service for the record, um, but every one of them had their credit cards stolen. And the culprit was an open access point that had been plugged directly into their local network. Somebody had hacked it and placed a bot on one of the local computers. And so minutes after they were all there, their credit cards were all compromised, which I don't want to go after 40 prosecutors myself. Probably picked the wrong batch. But anyway, that is a very real danger. Um, we actually, our boxes uh, carry um, two different types of security form. One is we can create a rule that does not allow the network to be traversed whatsoever. So the only avenue the wireless users have is to go out the firewall, out to the Internet. If they can then come back in via, you know, some permissions that the store has, that's something different than the store wants. But we can force all traffic out. The wireless public Wi-Fi users actually use a separate wireless signal that has a separate subnet and network to it. So there's nothing that matches and never crosses over with the private side or any private wireless network that we build out of the same box. So we absolutely keep things very separate, very secure. Um, on those spots. Travis, what kind of um, issues do you run up against when you're doing, um, say, we've talked a lot, a lot about uh, retail chains, and those are pretty small, uh, you know, for the most part. Uh, in terms of their area of the of their sites, what about something like um, uh, like I'm looking at the Dayton Convention Center or something larger? Uh, what what type of challenges do those uh, bring? Um, it depends. Um, in the case, and I'll, I'll use the convention center as an I as a uh, example. Um, in the case where let's let's call it a totally greenfield experience, so there is absolutely no Wi-Fi existing whatsoever. We start from scratch. The, the, the only challenge is going in and doing the surveys to see how many access points are necessary. It's not a big deal. Uh, we just have to contract for it and get it done. Uh, it doesn't take very long. Uh, we've got the guys that do our site surveys for us actually just finished doing uh, whatever they call Jacob Field in Cleveland now. If somebody bought the rights to it. But they just did that entire stadium. Uh, so size isn't really an issue. Um, if they already have existing Wi-Fi, they just want to put our service to it. It's no different than what we were talking earlier, which is about 30 seconds, and we can uh, back-end any network. So that's pretty easy on that front. 
Um, so really, it's not any more challenging to do a big, you know, big area as it is to do a small coffee shop. They really are very similar. So we have the Kentucky State Fair going on right now at the fairgrounds. Uh, and would you have the ability to have uh, different landing pages, say, with different areas of the fairgrounds? And, and let me, because you got the, uh, like the West Wing has all the, uh, um, the, the animals and the, the, the shows going on. And then another section has Kentucky Kingdom and another section has, you know, some of the, uh, uh, the, the contests and things that they did, like, you know, biggest watermelon and all that kind of thing. Uh, and then another section is just kind of shops and, and booths and things like that. Could you have different landing pages throughout that whole scenario? Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, um, we, through a partner, um, have three fairgrounds already covered in Ohio doing exactly that. And what's nice about what those kind of opportunities have is those have opportunities for revenue that go above and beyond standard you know, management rates, you can actually get into things like, you know, does a booth need Wi-Fi access that's secure to run credit cards over? Or, you know, do they want uh, any special features being delivered to vendors at those fairs? So there's a lot of opportunity for revenues in those kinds of uh, places. Same with trade shows, then, I would think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, I mean, the Dayton Convention Center, just as an example, uh, we have a trade show in there next week for 800 people. Uh, the show has an app they want everybody to have downloaded. And so they came to us. They said, okay, we, you know, because in that case, we actually do wire drops uh, at the convention center for them as well for hardwire. Um, so we're delivering hardwire drops into three or four different places. But we're also then creating enough bandwidth and uh, opening enough space that we can have 600 people on their phones at the same time all trying to download an app. Um, so, yes, they got billed quite substantially to have that service. Well, there's just so many different things you could you could do with this. If you guys start putting your hats on and think about it with, you know, whether it's um, hospitals or hotels or convention centers or ballparks and stadiums, um, country club. I mean, everyone's got <laughs> country a, club. a university that plays football or basketball uh, to some degree. Even the, the smaller towns like Owensboro, Kentucky, has Kentucky Wesleyan, and that may be small to a lot of folks, but to the people there, it's huge, uh, and they fill that arena up. And, and it's just all, it, what it comes down to is taking care of their customers and giving them, and, and then also commoditizing that and taking advantage of the opportunity when they're using their network, right? And the other thing to remember is actually because of how we can incorporate marketing departments into some of these uh, solutions, you can actually see a lot of the IT people's wheels start kind of rolling, going a little bit because a lot of times we can become a, uh, a OPEX uh, purchase as opposed to a CAPEX. So they're actually able to roll it out into marketing dollars and keep it out of the IT budget. So there's a lot of flexibility that people get excited about in larger corporations. Travis, what's the, uh, and maybe this might be the last one unless somebody else has, else has a question out there, but what are some of the reasons why somebody uh, has said no or has delayed the, the purchase decision? What are some of the objections we're going to run into? I can help objections. you with that, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Tell me, Kent. Yeah, go. Well, I mean, there were objections we all came over. I think one thing about the HarborLink thing which impressed me was because they looked at competitors, um, Travis is very accommodating to work with budgets and things like that. They wanted to stage out how things were paid or, you know, um, how things were bought. Some uh, typical, uh, typical of a telecom contract, I mean, he was like, how do you want to work this? Uh uh, what are we doing that one annually, I believe? I, yeah, we're doing I it every six months. months. Every yeah. six months. Uh, typically, I think it's every month, but we worked out a, a plan where they pay every six months uh, for the entire outfit. And he's just easy to work with. I think it was very, I mean, he, he'll sit there and listen to what the customer, from everything from the CapEx to the budget to what they're trying to do applications-wise. I just think it's it's not a cookie-cutter uh, uh, agent program. I mean, he's really—they're really willing to earn the business and do what it takes. 
because I know some of the other people they were talking to was like, you got to pay this monthly, you have to buy this now, this is how it is. Um, so. I well, I some, of the, some of the objections you get are, man, we don't want to buy $500,000 worth of equipment day one. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and he's he's willing to work that out. Well, let's break it out. Let's amortize it over the plan. Let's break it out monthly. Let's, all kinds of different ideas. So. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to that background in sales because I don't like letting sales go. So <laughs> we're gonna we're, we're gonna work with you to get the damn thing. He's gonna make it happen, you know. I mean, so it's 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 yeah. the equipment layout, and then the other um, big thing is a lot of people, especially with the mattress, we don't have the staff to deploy this, and they're willing to help out there as well. So um, yeah, uh, that and actually that's probably the biggest one we hear. Um, it, obviously, number one, and that's, I don't care what you're selling, it might as well be uh, gum drops. The biggest thing people are going to always complain about is price. Uh, um, so, once you get past the price argument, uh, and you show what it's worth and all that good stuff, the biggest thing you run into is people being afraid of the implementation. And where I can, you know, pat myself on the back a little bit, and I'm going to, is we are, we have worked for a lot of years on how to make this easy. And our solution, we actually won BP North America back in 2008. And we were up against every big telecom name you can imagine. We were in against AT&T, T-Mobile, uh, you know, the Dells of the world were in there. I mean, we went against everybody. And we came out the winner because they said, well, there's 8,000 uh, sites. How are you going to do this? I said, it's easy. We're going to mail it to them. And they said, what do you mean you're going to mail it to them? I said, the guy who's sitting behind the, do- the desk selling you your smokes or your chewing gum can install our product. That's how easy we've made this. So we've got a robust platform that can be installed so simply it takes five minutes, tops. Um, and that's where we've really been able to overcome a lot of those things, is that it's not this dreaded installation of, you know, that's going to take hours upon hours. It, it's a very simple process. And uh, so that's one of the big ones is uh, the rollout fears and things like that. But, uh, yeah. And, Kent, you're right. Uh, I was there at Dayton when uh, when Kent and the customer came up uh, with Travis and we went to that store. And, uh, you know, we turned that thing up in, in just a matter of a few minutes. And, and the longest part was just finding it, right? I mean, yeah. and then once, once, he, once Travis got under there, he plugged it in, and away we went. We were all on the on the Wi-Fi there almost instantly. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the, the boot-up time is 47 seconds. So once you find power and you find where to plug it in, then you're ready to fly. Okay, any questions out there, guys? All right, then. Uh, Kent, I appreciate you hopping on and, uh, and uh, adding your two cents and your insights into – how this worked for you and Travis. Uh, obviously, appreciate uh, you being the featured sponsor today and, and presenter for our solutions partners and telling us more about Harbor Link Networks. And as I wrap this up, guys, just to uh, record these uh, web calls, we make them available on the Derby Agency channel on YouTube, uh, and you also can see and watch all of these from your Derby Agency mobile app as well. And I know all of you have downloaded the Derby Agency mobile app onto your smartphone by now so that you can submit opportunities and even hit the Talk to Sherm button. Everyone keeps asking me how Sherm is, and Sherm, you heard him on this call. He's doing great. He is uh, getting stronger every day, uh, and, and I hear that he might be behind the wheel driving a car here uh, in the near future. So with that, right, everyone, man. you have a great you guys have a great week, a great weekend, and we'll see you again next next Thursday. Thanks, everybody. They're already. I don't have to be here forever, but they don't get them.